forge your inner armor. Welcome to the Inner Armor Podcast with Dr. Timothy Royer, where we explore ways to train our brains and bodies to become dynamically resilient so that we can all, from professional athletes to ordinary people, perform at our potential. Well, welcome, Doc. You're back from uh, your travels and your European tour, your your Canary Island tour. Yeah, it was great. Uh, we were, you know, in about four different countries and some business and then also some pleasure. Got to see some great places in the world that I'd never uh, seen before. It's just it's just awesome. What a big world we live in, you know, and the different cultures and languages and food. And it's always good to kind of get out of the bubble and um, just realize how big the world is. Yeah, and how remarkable it all is and how many remarkable people that are all around the world doing so many really incredible things. But it's also good to get back home and back into the swing of things. And yeah. I know you've got a busy schedule coming up this spring. Yeah. But to kind of set that up, people know you for your work with the NFL, with the NBA, but you've also done a lot of work with elite golfers and elite competitive golfers. And that's a lot of times different than what most people think of as recreational golf, because recreational golf is often sort of imprecise and not very powerful and often somewhat unfocused uh, when it's your buddies out playing. But you've worked with elite players at the PGA level, the LPGA level, elite collegiate levels. And this is where precision, power, and focus really, really come into play in terms of winning championships, winning tournaments, all those kinds of things, winning major championships. And you've worked with players at all of those levels, right? Yeah, I'd say close to 15 years now. A lot of things, you know, up to 2007, everything was very clinical, much like you, you know, go to a, the hospital where I did a ton of work in hospital settings and in clinical settings. Uh, but we had worked with an NBA athlete, um, Chris Kamen, who um, his story became so well known because he had such a quick turnaround. And so they did an ESPN piece um, outside the lines, uh, which uh, with Rick Buecher, which I was in. And uh, man, after that, the whole sports thing took off. And within a year or two, I started having uh, some some pro golfers come to me. And man, since then, you know, it's been dozens of golfers that I've assessed and, and worked with. And you mentioned the difference between kind of amateur and pro, and you don't think it's that big of a gap, but I remember the first golfer I worked with, uh, Tracy Hansen, who was on the tour for a number of years. She's in the college golf hall of fame. She's, you know, four time all American lot did great. And, in golf, in pro golf for 15, six, 16 years on the LPGA yeah, tour. Yeah. I mean, it she's wasn't. legit. Right. And I started working with Tracy and, um, I start, she was like hitting, you know, nine irons. Right. And I'm thinking, I think, you know, I want to be within about 10 yards and she had these flags out there and they were like three feet away from each other. And she's just like nailing every one of them. And I went back from that time there when I was working with her. I'm like, I don't know if I ever want to play golf again. It was so <laughs> disappointing because they're so good. Yeah. I mean, it is amazing how good. And you realize I can never, ever do anything like that. But I've loved working with the golfers. I've actually had an opportunity once to caddy for, for a golfer. And it was so, a pro golfer. And it was so funny because I think she was looking out for me through the whole round more than focusing on her game <laughs> saying, you're in the, you're in the wrong place. You know, I was standing in front of different things I shouldn't be standing in, but that was quite an experience. And it was exhausting. Oh my gosh. One of the most physical things I think I've ever done was a uh, caddying. Uh, but yeah, I've had some really cool experiences in golf, uh, been in golf magazine, uh, worked with, uh, individual or assessed an individuals number t number one in the world uh, uh four or five times um so yeah i really love it it's great uh group of athletes to work with a little di lot different than a football player or an, a basketball player uh because there's so much they all involve mental ability but it's so much in golf how much the mind is involved in it 
Well, yeah. I mean, wasn't it, I think Jack Nicholas's coach once said that, you know, golf is 90% mental and the other 10% is mental too. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. Right? But, no. but it, yeah. it is in as much as, and the margin of victory or the margin of success at that level, again, I think some people think of golf as a recreational, you know, go out on Saturday afternoon, go to the Go to your local, you know, uh, charity scramble or your annual company outing or something like that with a scramble or something. And it's it's kind of imprecise and unfocused. But when you're talking about elite major championship PGA, LPGA level golf, you know, elite division one championship national golf teams uh, at the collegiate level, the margin between winning and losing all of these guys, all these guys are really good really really good and the, it's it's just one tenth of one percent improvement is the difference between you know winning that championship or or not right so they're looking for an edge and i know you've worked with some of these players who have sought you out because they're looking for that edge yeah so i know that you recently have been talking to some of these collegiate golf teams and you you talk a lot about when you talk to them about what it takes to achieve to win, right? What is yeah. you know, you're you're looking at that trophy over there. Here's me, here's the here's the trophy. What do I have to do to sort of close the gap between where I am and hoisting that trophy at the end of the the last round? You want you want to talk about how you sh- how you speak to the not only as players but their coaches about how do it close that gap and achieve success. Yeah, I kind of, uh, I just recently spoke at the uh, men and women's uh, golf coaches in um, college golf event in Las Vegas. A wonderful event, great group of people. Uh, Wow. And out out of that, we're doing a uh, number of assessments across the country. We thought it was going to be six to eight, but uh, it's going to be over well over 20 of different collegiate schools and uh, programs and really excited to interact with all these coaches. But we kind of opened up with, and this is kind of also not just for golf, but it's for life in general, is if you can imagine you, you've got this prize, this trophy, like you mentioned, that you want to hoist in the air and uh, coaches or players, whoever, they also, to get to that prize, uh, we don't just go out with n- no plan. But we have a plan, something that's going to work, whether we glean that from other individuals or from experiences or things that we study or become educated in. And so many coaches, so many players have great plans, you know, and they they have that uh, willingness to prepare to win. You know, they have that work ethic. But there's something that stands in between the great plan and the prize. And that is what I would call the processor. And the processor is the brain and uh, the ability to master. And as you've said many times, Greg, to command and control, to command and control this processor is really the game changer in all this. It's what makes the plan, puts legs to the plans so that you can reach for that prize and actually obtain it. And so as we look at that processor, that's what we want to talk about today, is how to get command and control of this processor. It's not always just the best plan wins or the person who's the most motivated, the person with the most work ethic. It's really how efficient is that processor, the brain. Yeah. When you look at that plan, and I, I, you know, as soon as you said that, I couldn't help thinking about the epic words of another athletic champion, Mike Tyson. Yeah, because Mike Tyson famously said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. (laughs) Right. And and then your plan has to change. Right. And, you know, I'm I I love to play golf. I I play as much golf as I can. I'm not as good as I would like to be, but I sure like to play. And I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of the sport and I love to watch it. And I've been to, you know, some PGA tournaments and got a chance and, you know, to, to see it up close. And, and I'll, I'll tell you one thing that, that gets me is how often you'll take somebody who's the, you know, tournament favorite going into the first round and then they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, all the plans that they made on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday 
go out the door and they have to make new plans. So you want to talk a little bit about that? You know, it's, it sort of goes into the category of what we can tr- control proactively and what we have to sort of react to in, in, a, in a sport and in life in general. Yeah. I mean, I would take uh, people who are super interested back to uh, one of our third or fourth podcasts where we talked about dynamic resilience. And we're talking a lot about the, our life is full of rhythms of ups and downs. There's high tide, there's low tide, there's night, there's day, there's all these rhythms. And then there's these things that come into our life that are completely unexpected. And you expect the ball to bounce a certain way and it bounces another way. Okay. Cause it just hit the wrong thing. And how, what are you going to do with that lie? Um, and the reactivity to that of the autonomic nervous system is the key component into how we're going to respond to that moment in time. And so the more we can control the nervous system that it stays balanced and doesn't get stuck in this sympathetic state. It's not just led or reacting to whatever the environment does, but it's doing the opposite. The environment can do anything that it wants to, but the nervous system is in complete control. It's kind of like working with special forces that are truly in life and death situations, but yet we're able to control what their hearts are doing, how their pupils are dilating or constricting, what's going on with blood flow, and keeping that all under control, even though the situation would say, you should be out of control, but they're controlling it. It's the same type of training that needs to go into the golfer in order to, for them to manage the unpredictable, because it's really the unpredictable and the, how the people manage the unpredictable that define whether you get the prize or not. Because it's not just a putt-putt course that you play day in and day out that has the exact same lie and everything going on. Everything's changing on a golf course. And that's why it's so addicting to play because it's not the same all the time, right? Um, So it's that resilience, that ability to adapt, which is uh, controlling what state the autonomic nervous system is in and keeping it out of this sympathetic state which can cause the um, brain to light up with a lot of electrical current and cause the adrenaline to overproduce. You've got to be out there for four hours. The last thing you want is the HPA axis, that's hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland, that system to be overactivated because you can't sustain that energy for long periods of time. So it's all about commanding and controlling the autonomic nervous system. You know, when t- you talk about commanding the ANS, one of the things you've talked about so much before and even in other episodes here is the difference between your ANS shifting into sympathetic mode because of sensory input, right? So this is, you know, you famously talked about the zebra or whatever sees the lion, right? Or you're driving along in your car and a truck swerves in front of you. And, you know, obviously that's a sensory impact and, and input that you have to react to. So I can think of the golfer who says, well, you know, I hit my ball, I go down to look for it, and I find that for whatever reason, it's laying against a tree root or it's got some terrible lie. Now, that's a sort of a sensory input that you have to react to. But there's, you've also talked a lot about the what ifs and what abouts. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's interesting about this sport is that because players are playing across the course all over the time, you don't always know what your opponent is doing unless you look at the scoreboard. So you can be playing along, feel like you're playing really well, but you'll pass some scoreboard and realize that somebody, you know, four holes behind you or four holes ahead of you is just, you know, made a birdie or an eagle or whatever, three birdies in a row. And all of a sudden, now that becomes a different kind of reaction, right? Your brain starts thinking about where you are in the scoreboard and where you are, right, on the leaderboard, you know, on the leaderboard and, and, and where you are in relation to others and all those hypotheticals begin to creep into your mind, right? And, and so h- talk about how players can control that aspect, the what ifs, the what abouts. Yeah, um, and that goes back to um, controlling the, at the core. Now, we've talked about this before, is you've got, imagine these like, a, it's like a bullseye with concentric circles, okay? I can 
work with an outside ring, which is maybe my thoughts, or I can work with the physiology, which is a little further in, which has to do with my breathing and my heart rate variability and my uh, adrenal release. Or I can even get to the core, which is the neurological response to what's going on. That's where it all starts. So, so it starts to the neurological and works out. A lot of times in golf, and I'm not opposed to it, but becomes a very like cognitive therapy thing where you're, you're dealing with an, an outer thought process or a visual imagery, which is good. But sometimes the situations create such a reaction in the nervous system that you're not really getting any headway with those thoughts. So we have to work with mastering the core, which is the neurological. And that's where getting feedback on what the neurological sort of system is doing. So um, there's a great picture of uh, me and Bryson DeChambeau uh, at the BMW Classic, I think, a few years back. It was the about seven months before I think he won the U.S. Open. But you'll see he's in a sand trap, and this is for kind of uh, practicing before he's going to go do his round. He's in the sand trap, and he has all these wires connected to him. And you'd be like, what are those wires? And if you look to the side of the picture, I'm standing up on the ridge of the sand trap, and I have a laptop, and I'm reading all these different variables in Bryson's body while he's in the sand trap. You can see the picture in the golf magazine, right? And well, why am I doing that? I'm doing that to give him feedback on, hey, your heart's racing too fast right now. Your skin temperature's off. Your breathing's off. Not in this situation, but with other golfers, I've literally had an EEG hooked to them. And we can look at their electrical activity in the brain while they're in the sand trap or while they're walking down the green or getting ready to hit the putt. And the key is keeping those variables under control because once they get out of balance, then the racing thoughts start. Then the what ifs, what if this happens? And we create this, this uh, ripple effect of anxiety that tends to escalate really fast. Or the what abouts, what about just happened? Or what's going on with this other situation, the golfer that's three holes back, right? But if I can control all those internal variables, it stops those thoughts before they happen. Anybody that's played golf and sat over a putt, you know what, what happens, right? Is you just overthink and you don't just do, right? And you're not present. You're, you're someplace else, right? You're in the what ifs and the what abouts. And we just need to be present. And so we start by looking all at these neurological and physiological variables and teach the golfer how to control those in any situation. So let me give you an example. Okay. So when the brain is running faster, that's because there's fast brain waves called high betas that are out of control. And so these brain waves are cycling at 20 cycles a second, 27 cycles a second. And we can read these in real time. And I can read that with a Bluetooth, with Bluetooth, right? Onto my laptop. So I've walked with many a pro golfer down the while we're playing a whole round of golf they have eeg leads on and we have their favorite playlist playing so they're hearing music whatever they like to hear but the playlist is connected to their brainwave activity <laughs> so the moment the high beta the neurological response starts to go too fast and it's really kind of odd when it can happen it's not always just over a putt in a certain situation. It can be walking down the fairway, you know, it can be some other time. But the moment that person starts to begin the cascade of anxiety, which starts with high beta, fast wave activity, the playlist will immediately stop playing the music, which is so cool, right? Like, and they know, oh, wait a minute, my brain's racing. Now, with that feedback loop, we can stop the initiation of this cascade before it gets too far downstream, right? So if you, if in your most anxious state, let's say that's your brain running 120 miles an hour, that's your most anxious state, right? For me to try to intervene with you 
at 119 is too late. Your, your, your whole body has responded. Your heart's racing. The adrenaline's been released. You know, it's just not going to happen. And I've been doing working as a neuropsychologist for a long time. I'm not going to bring you back at 119. Okay. But what about if I could get you familiar with the difference between 65 miles an hour and 67 miles an hour? Well, I can stop that process before it ever kicks in. And we're so far ahead of the game by giving feedback to the brain that it keeps us out of those states before they ever happen. You know, what you're talking about, right, is like classic operant conditioning, right? B.F. Skinner and this kind of thing, right, where you groove something. And I was thinking as you're talking about that, uh, this is exactly how golf swing coaches Right. What they're always trying to do, they're trying to get me to do it my whole life. Right. Which is to f- know what that swing feels like. Yes. Right. After a while, then you don't think about it. Right. But the thing is, when you're trying to learn a swing move, they work really hard to get you to the point where you know what it's supposed to feel like to make that move. And then it becomes grooved. Right. You know what it feels like to do this. You know uh, where your hands are supposed to be, where your you know hips are supposed to be, where the hands are supposed to be at release, and you know so on and so forth. And you're trying to what you're saying is you're taking that same principle and applying it to their brainwave patterns and their other biometrics. So you're saying in the same way that you're trying to learn what the physical swing feels like, you're also trying to learn what the mental brain dynamics are. In that swing, right? Absolutely. Uh, Spot on. And it, the brain can learn to differentiate the difference between 65 miles an hour and 66 miles an hour. It just needs feedback. And when I say miles per hour, I'm using that, you know, as a, as a example or metaphor of brain activity, which isn't really measured in miles per hour, but Uh, Our audience knows what we're talking about, right? But you know what 120 miles an hour feels like, right? We know because that's the time, you know, we're about ready to throw the club into the, you know, lake, right? Um, You can learn what 65 miles an hour feels like. And when you do, if you have the proper tools, which get into some of the breathing, heart rate variability, decreasing the neurological baseline, uh, having preparation of good sleep and a variety of other things, you're able to stop that thing, that cascade from happening to the point that you can keep the anxiety under control no matter what hits you in the mouth, right? You're able to, to stay in control because you've gotten feedback from that. But if that feed, the only way to get that feedback is on the brain is with technology that enables us to see it in real time. And when I can see it, and the brain can see itself, much like we look at ourselves in a mirror, it can adapt and learn some very precise alterations of when it's feeling different things at all times. Well, it's interesting, you know, you talk about having that actual data to react to instead of just right? Impressions or whatever. And I know that when you were working with Bryson DeChambeau, right? I mean, that was the year that I think he won the US Open and everything, right? And and part of it is, is he's so famous for wanting data about everything. Yeah. Um, swing, I mean, everything, you know, his, his, you know, increasing his swing speed. I mean, everything, he's a data-driven guy. But what I think about is how often players will try to achieve this slowing down their brain and everything else by just telling themselves to calm down, right? I mean, talk a little bit about that. You know, obviously it's a good thing to do to go, you know, walk to the other end of the tee box, take a breath, try to calm down. But you can't sort of fix what's going on with your autonomic nervous system by just sort of initially, you know, telling yourself to take it easy and calm down. There, there, this is something that takes data and training, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea of go take a deep breath is ridiculous. I mean, that's not going to do it. And that I think that brings us to one of our first big kind of concepts in here, which is what I refer to as continuum golf. Okay. If you think about your golf swing, it's probably a second and a half. And I think, what did you say? If we added it up on a good round, 
102 seconds? Well, yeah. So if 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 it's one and a half seconds for a swing, which seems about right, right? Yeah. Um, and you have, let's say you shoot a 70, two under par. When the kind of golfers we're talking about, that's that's going to be a normal round, right? Yeah. So 70 times 1.5, that's 105 seconds, which is less than two minutes. So out of a four hour round of golf, you're only swinging the club. You're only actually hitting the ball less than two minutes. And the thing that strikes me about that is that means that there's what, three hours and 98 minutes of thinking uh, <laughs> between the shots. Yeah. Three hours and 58 minutes. Or 58, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, no, never, never, do, never do math in public. Exactly. Or while you're trying to do a podcast, right? Like all of a sudden. Um, but, and that's the space. I'm not even going to say it's the space in between. <laughs> it's the space that dominates this whole thing. The three hours and 55 minutes. That isn't just a one breather. I mean, who knows how many breaths you're going to breathe during that three hours and 58 minutes. If we want to be breathing six breaths a minute, Okay, well, there's a lot of breaths going on there. And there's so many things in the golf round in just how we do it that I'll just throw a couple out here. Okay, uh, you, take a, you take your swing on your driver, right, uh, or your irons, and you hold that club up over your shoulder on your follow through. And when I'm measuring what's going on physiologically, I would say close to 90% of golfers are holding their breath while they're watching that ball go. Well, guess what? The shot was over the moment it struck your club. You need to be preparing for the next shot. You're like, well, doc, that's 10 minutes away. I got to walk all the way down. No, preparation starts the moment that ball strikes the club. I'm preparing for the next one. And the worst thing you can be doing is holding your breath and screwing up your comp- your autonomic nervous system because your autonomic nervous system does not know that you hit a white ball and you're anticipating what's it going to do. It wonders why are we not getting any oxygen right now? And so it activates the HPA axis and I start releasing adrenaline prematurely, right? Here's another thing that happens. I get up to the uh, uh, putting green and I'm trying to get a lot, get my lie. And all of a sudden, you know, I get down in a crouch position to get behind the ball, look at it. Maybe I walk around it. I crouch down again and then I come back up again. Okay. Think about how many times you're crouching down and getting back up again, which is creating massive amount of stress on the cardiovascular system. You know, just do a few squats and tell me what your heart starts doing. Right. And so you're doing that. But most golfers aren't thinking about supplying the body with the right type of oxygen when it's about ready to do this squat. And so when they do that, when they're not thinking about that, there's this whole crisis that starts to happen where you're short of breath and now you're sitting over the putt and you're saying, why am I feeling anxious? It might not actually have anything to do with the putt. It could have to be with how you're managing the space in between. One last one, and there's all kinds of them, is I've got to walk from point A to point B, okay? It might be 200 yards, 300 yards, right? Well, with, with, all, Bry- with Bryson DeChambeau, it's like 500 yards. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. So I'm walking all this space, but it's not like I'm on a, a moving sidewalk, right? That's perfectly flat. I'm going up and down. I'm watching where my footing is going on. And all of a sudden, there's like a big rise to an elevated green. Am I thinking about, well, wait a minute, what's my oxygen supply and demand going to be as I walk up this incline to this green? Nobody's thinking about it. And they're putting themselves in very poor autonomic nervous system preparation for that next shot. And we have to be preparing in between every second with what's going on with the the nervous system for these continuum golf. 
you know, the golf coaches are there, the swing coaches, they're, they're going to do their thing and they're all really good. My job is to help you do all the three hours and 58 minutes. Get your head into the game and your body and your brain under complete command and control. So you can step up and execute. I mean, even, Absolutely. you know, I have, I have a friend who's tried going to, you know, qualifying school, the Q school and, you know, dreams of making it on the tour and all that sort of thing. And, you know, one of the things he talks about is, you know, kind of collapsing under pressure. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking so famously when you look at somebody at Augusta National at the Masters and it's Sunday, the back nine uh, at Augusta National um, on Sunday is epic for making people you know, for people just collapsing. Right. right. And these are the literally the, the greatest golfers on the planet and, and they're in pos- contention to win on the back nine. And yet, oh, we've all watched that for years, how it can just kind of come apart for somebody. That, right. And I mean, it's, it's like, Absolutely. even on that, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, 50 swings or so, or, you know, 50 seconds of swing or something in the whole back exactly. nine and for those 50 seconds, but, you know, spread over three hours. So it's, it's like, now you got to step up and execute. Exactly. Uh, and so, so talk a little bit about that in terms of w- what the players need to be doing too, to, to be in that optimal place. Uh, you, you know, the autonomic nervous system, the breathing, the mental space, how, what what contributes to those kinds of collapses and and how can they overcome that yeah it's it's a multifaceted thing and where i like to start with most people is um if you remember back from previous episodes the autonomic nervous system and you even alluded to today is taking information through our through our visual system so you know we get 11 million pieces of information a second 10 million of them are visual. Think about how much visual demand is on you when you're playing golf. I mean, you could just put the list of different things that you need to be doing visually. And so much of those are judging distances, depth perception, right? And so you've got a card that's telling you how, what the, you know, the yardage is, or you've walked it off and it tells you what the yardage is. But if your binocular system is not strong, and that's the use of both the left and the right eye, you're going to get information unconsciously about that distance that may be in conflict with what your brain is telling you about that distance. Your, the card is telling me this. I walked it off. The putt is 15 feet. But my eyes, because I don't have a very precise binocular system, which has to do with convergence and divergence of both eyes that work like two cameras to give me this beauty of binocularity. If those aren't precise and they're telling me unconsciously, no, that looks like it's 13 feet. But I'm saying to myself, no, it's 15 feet. Then I go to sit over the putt and I have this conflict. I've got the unconscious pushing against the conscious. The unconscious will always win, by the way. And I fall short, right? Or I read it too far left, you know, and it should be, have gone right. And well, even, I was saying, even on full swing shots. So you look at tee shots or, right. or shots on the fairway. So I, I, know a, I know a very, very successful golf course architect. Um, he's designed 100 courses all around the world. I mean, just really amazing very expensive golf courses, you know, and the last time I had lunch with him, he was talking about how much the course architect works to sort of, I don't say deceive you, but to some degree to deceive yes. you. That's, yeah. that's his job. You know, we're not just standing out in a field, hitting balls down a football field. The, the whole thing is meant to draw your eye here, to change your depth perception, to, to sort of align the tee box so that you're sort of the equilibrium of your ears making you feel like things are this way, but it's really that way. And when you play some of those kinds of courses, you really, yeah, that, that being able to align your eyes, make those depth perceptions, see, take in the right visual inputs and not the wrong ones, um, you know, are super tough. You know, I've played a couple of uh, Pete Dye's famous courses before, and he's famous for like 
making you look right misdirection, making you look at the wrong things. Yeah. And so it, it and then I, I stand on the tee box and your, your pulse rate goes up and your breathing goes up and right. And everything, because you're completely thrown off and you're not even sure what you're aiming at. Yeah. And so I would say, I would argue that the, the most important muscles in golf are your eye muscles. And I would love to, to ask how many people trying to play the game of golf or playing at an elite level are working on the synchronization of their eye muscles. And uh, it's funny, in the pro football side, I have quarterbacks that before games will come in and do our visual training to almost like stretch their eyes and get them in sync, just like we would stretch our legs or our arms. And I have golfers that do this as well because those muscles, they got to go out and they got to be acting that whole four hours and they better be dead on correct and line up the conscious with the unconscious, or I'm going to make mistakes that are more reflective of poor perception or poor data inputs. Um, and another thing about the eyes is your pupils uh, in, in the eyes actually change based on stress and relaxation. So they can become dilated or they can become constricted. Okay. And when they're dilated, what happens is we become very tunnel vision. So it's very narrow because it's a stressful state. And that narrowness causes us to really compromise our depth perception. So when I've activated the adrenal system, not only am I causing other issues with you know breathing and heart rate and my muscle activity, but I've also changed the my pupil to be, make it more dilated and create more tunnel vision and lose my depth perception. And you know nobody really thinks about that, but um, I think in the ne next episode we'll talk about this is like well how do we control the natural dilation and constriction of the pupil through our breathing so it lines up with what we're doing because some of that happens naturally with the breath but you probably never really thought about that like when i am stressed now my visual data is further compromised because my eye is taking in information differently because it thinks it needs to focus on what's right in front of me, like the snake, right? Like when I'm in the woods and the snake comes out and I go into sympathetic, my pupils will dilate so that I can become very focused on that snake. And I could care less about what color the leaves are or the little squirrel in the tree to my right because I am tunnel vision. We'll use that sometimes when we talk about people who are really obsessive is their tunnel vision, but that literally happens as a protective mechanism. And how do we fight against that as a golfer? And as a coach of a golfer, how do I teach them to control that so that that doesn't become my enemy in this whole process? There's already enough things to conquer on a golf course, right? So, Doc, you've talked about the continuum principle, the realization that out of a four-hour round of golf, you're only swinging the club 105 seconds and that you have to manage your precision, your power and focus over all of that. But you have another principle that comes to bear here. You, do you want to unpack that for us? Yeah. Um, a lot of times we, separ we try to separate in uh, well, many things, but golf in particular, uh, the mind over the body. And um, we try to override that and don't create that connection that actually when leveraged correctly can become a very powerful tool. And so as I've studied this in golfers, what we've discovered is there's in a, if you think of a typical good diaphragmatic breath that would take about 10 seconds to do, okay, so six breaths per minute from the diaphragm, which we can control when we're doing golf. It's a little bit harder when you're running up and down a basketball court, but you can control that diaphragmatic breath. That when you look at the up and down of the diaphragmatic breath, there's something that's called the point of action that we've defined. And in this point of action, we define a place in that breath that we want to create impact on the ball. And so there's also another place right before that, that in the swing would be the time at which we pull the club back. We prepare it for the swing. Okay. And, um, 
We'll also talk in a later episode about how we put this all into a full golf routine. But in the point of impact, we're leveraging the up and down of the nervous system. So in every breath, when I inhale oxygen, it's because I was out of oxygen. Okay. So because I was out of oxygen, my whole system started to speed up for a few seconds because it was like, where's the oxygen? And so during that inhale, I am in a sympathetic response or a stress response because I just came out of a very, it's very, seems, doesn't seem very big, but it is a minor crisis point in every breath. I was out of oxygen. So all in that inhale, everything's kind of recouping. So if you would look at what your body's doing, it's very internally focused when you're at the bottom of your breath and now you start to inhale. It's all sympathetic. My pupils are dilated. My muscles are tense. My heart's going faster. The literally you watch the heartbeat. It's going faster. Okay. Then I get all the oxygen. So I'm at the top of my breath. Okay. I'm at the top. And then at that moment, everything relaxes and goes into a parasympathetic response. So the, the pupils will literally constrict, the muscles will change, the heart will beat slower. And it's at this point that the body's willing to externally focus where it will care about the little white ball. It doesn't care about the white ball on the inhale, but it'll care about it if that's what you want it to care about because now it's in about a four to five second relaxed state. And it's at that moment that we want to line up every system in our body when it's in that relaxed state. And that's when we're going to impact the ball. And that becomes the rails upon which we put the train of golf on is that inhale and that exhale. And I'll have pro golfers that will tell me all I, you know, they'll shoot their best round. And I'll say, well, what'd you do? All I did was just focus on my breath. I, I, and actually I, that's all I did is I just was inhale, exhale. Some of us who aren't, you know, pro golfers, it's harder to do because we're just trying to remember the golf swing. Remember what am I supposed to do? But, when you can get to that point where you rely on that breath, that's where you always go back to is kind of like a safety net. Okay, I got to get back on the rails, get back on the rails. And that point of action is going to be right after I've gotten the full inhale and I'm just starting the exhale. And if we use a, a, a sound cue, what I typically say is we're breathing in such a way that we can hear the breath. So we're doing through our lips a, and then the exhale. And that sound becomes the trigger for when I'm going to pull the club back so that I can strike it during that parasympathetic point of action. Wow, that, 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 that's incredible. I mean, in all of the golf instruction I've had in my life, never really quite thought about it that way or ha- had that presented. But, right, you know, you think about when to initiate the swing, when to initiate the downswing, all of this. But to, sync, to sequence that, with my breathing, my, my nervous system, you know, my respiratory system, what's going on in my brain waves. This is really taking things to the next level. And I know we're going to, what we're going to do is roll over and just keep this conversation is getting kind of the end of this episode, but man, this is so interesting and it's application to other sports as well, because yes. this point of action idea, you know, would be relevant to shooting free throws or taking slap shots or 10,000 other things that, you know, you might be able to do. So we're going to roll over and just keep talking about bringing precision, power, and focus to uh, sports performance, particularly elite sports performance. And uh, we'll talk some more about golf and, and compare it to some other major sports as well. Awesome. This has been the Inner Armor Podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Would you please follow or subscribe and make sure to leave us a review or comment. You can learn more about Inner Armor, Dr. Royer, and how to perform at your potential by going to forgeinnerarmor.com.